Everybody. I'm so glad that you've um, been able to uh, join us this afternoon uh, to our um, second inaugural program for the Intercultural Learning Series uh, titled Showcasing Successful Intern Research. And so today, uh, as part of a collaborative uh, event uh, between the Paul Peck Humanities Inst uh, Intern Institute and the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, we're going to showcase some successful research conducted by Nirene Monforte, uh, graduating in spring of 21, um, uh, joined by project lead Patty Artiaga from the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Uh, my name is Professor Arana. I coordinate the honors internship program for the Paul Peck Humanities Institute. And I will start off today by just giving a brief overview of our internship program and give you just some general resources for interested students and for faculty who might be able to motivate our students uh, to uh, aspire to this really eclectic and unique, powerful program. Uh, we will then move on to um, our project lead, uh, Patty Artiaga's presentation about the um, undocumented organizing collecting initiative, uh, which is a three-year project tracing the emergence of undocumented youth activism over the past 20 years by recording, analyzing and interpreting political strategies via the collection of oral histories and objects. So I'm very excited and very uh, thankful for everybody's time today. And so I'm just going to start off by um, sharing my screen and giving everybody a brief overview of our program. Great, so in our program, we have lots of opportunities for students and I'm just going to give you a few of them. Um, so what can PPHI internship uh, internships in the interdisciplinary humanities achieve for students. So students engage in 240 hours at national libraries and museums, such as the Library of Congress or the Smithsonian or other approved sites for the semester, either in the fall, the summer, or the spring. And students may also apply to uh, another internship that is not the Library of Congress or the Smithsonian Institute. Um, uh, one that is approved through our program. So certainly we encourage students to be creative um, in um, approaching their internship journeys. Um, as part of the research experience, students participate in a three credit honors program that is focused on research, certainly, and extensive writing and culminates with an independent research paper that is original and, um, uh, and, and, and expansive in scope. Um, admitted students uh, receive a scholarship towards tuition that is counted towards honors 275 and some other expenses. The Paul Peck Humanities Institute has certain goals that we'd like to um, support our students in achieving. Certainly we uh, motivate our students to develop their skill sets as they prepare for their transfer to a four-year institution. And then that certainly helps them contribute to their effectiveness in a professional environment. The internship uh, provides students hands-on experience in practicing troubleshooting, um, uh, solving problems, and certainly working with technology in our uh, last 12 months and working from home, many students have been engaging in virtual internships. Upon culmination of the internship, many students become uh, more prepared for a more sophisticated job upon graduation and really sets them apart from other institutions similar to other community colleges. We're very unique in that this institute, Paul Peck Humanities Institute, uh, provides students to intern at very interesting and new places. And um, as I mentioned, uh, they develop a scholarly problem solving approach that can help them um, attain graduate school experience. And very interestingly, um, many students often compete with other four-year institutions uh, where uh, upon graduation after four years, many students have completed two internships or more. And so we really encourage our students to take full advantage of all the internship opportunities at the college. Some recent internship activities involve performing collection analysis and organization. Here we see a picture of our past director and uh, some students at the Library of Congress. Uh, you see them all smiling, certainly from satisfaction of a job well done. Uh, sometimes students engage in digitizing museum or library collections, abstracting and archiving academic materials, producing audiovisual materials for site initiatives. And you'll see Nirene's presentation 
today involves some of that um, high order thinking and real, um, real world application of technology and storytelling. Um, certainly a testament to other internships, namely the digital storytelling internship that is uh, well lauded and, and very solid for our students, uh, as well as other professional or academic activities. And we encourage students from all disciplines and all fields and all majors to attend and to attempt to, um, to apply. We've had students from the sciences, from business, from political science, other social sciences, humanities, all the fields are welcome. So some uh, general um, nuts and bolts here about eligibility. Uh, our students need to have um, uh, to be at least 16 years of age at the time of application. They need to have completed at least 15 credit hours of coursework at Montgomery College and be currently enrolled and have no obligations to the college, meaning their bill should be in order at, with the business office. And they need to be honors eligible, meaning they need to have attained a 3.4 GPA or higher. And they need to definitely be matriculated in a degree program, meaning they need to have declared a major. And so that's really important. We incorporate into our program lots of mentoring, lots of support. And part of that is to make sure that students are ushered through and supported through uh, graduation. We want this internship program to be an enhancement, uh, but not a hindrance to their success. Um, and ultimately, uh, for the obvious purposes of conducting research, we want students to have successfully completed either English 102 or English 103 with a B or higher. Certainly an A is much more um, um, attractive for your application. And this is key because we want students to be able to put to practice all of the writing and literacy and research skills that they practiced in 101 and 102. I see some of our English faculty are here today, so they can certainly attest to the importance of strong academic research and writing. And so we really stretch you and challenge you to apply those skills in our program. Just a general overview of some of the application components. The students submit an application form. They submit a resume, a well-written application essay. You see I underscored that part. It's really important that we value the proper use of um, standard American English and um, all of the conventions incorporated into uh, academic research and writing. Students uh, contact two faculty members with whom they have a strong relationship, particularly in the classroom, to write a letter of recommendation and submit a faculty recommendation form. And finally, students submit an up-to-date official transcript through parchment to the uh, coordinator. So here is one last overview of the internship eligibility. My email is at the bottom. I'm happy to put that in the chat today, as well as our link to our website, where we have ample uh, resources for our students applying. Uh, in particular, I want to draw um, your attention to the Honors Writers Group. As you're preparing your, write, your writing pieces and your essays, please call upon those faculty members uh, to support you, as well as I will also support you um, uh, to strategize and to write your papers in such a way that reflect uh, a really Really robust vision for a good experience. Um, so thank you so very much uh, for that. I, I have my information here again. Uh, should you need to jot that down, our website is listed here, montgomerycollege.edu forward slash humanities. Uh, there you'll see our other internship programs, uh, among them the um, digital storytelling uh, internship, as well as the Paul Peck Humanities Institute Honors Internship Program. And here, finally, we have um, a general overview of the mission of our institute, which um, is listed here for your review. Excellent. So that is a general overview of our program. Um, uh, I do look forward to uh, seeing anybody applying, and I really encourage faculty here on the call today to support and call upon me to help them usher their students and to steward their students through the application process. I look forward to, to engaging you if I've not met you so far. Thank you so very much. And so now we're going to move on to our next uh, section, and I'm going to call upon Patty Arteaga again from the Smithsonian uh, National Museum of American History. She's going to again talk to us about the impetus and the general um, wor inner workings of the Undocumented Organizing Collective Initiative. Again, I want to reiterate that this initiative is a three-year project that has been tracing the emergence of undocumented youth activism over the past 20 years by recording analyzing and interpreting political strategies via the collection of oral histories and objects. Subsequent to her presentation this afternoon, we will hear from Nyreen, who will tell us about her journey as an intern, collaborating with Patty in this really transformational experience. Patty Arteaga, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. We give you a warm welcome. Um, you have our full attention. Yeah, so um, thank you and welcome, Eddie, for that kind um, introduction. 
As mentioned, my name is Patty Arteaga and I am the project lead for the Undocumented Organizing Collecting Initiative at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. It is a mouthful, I know. Um, but what that really means is that we as a collecting initiative have concerted energy um, and time to really look at one issue and that is within our political history uh, to look at undocumented organizing, which is folks without um, unauthorized um, documents to reside in the United States and who have taken up um, in sort of or uh, activism, or I like to better think of organizing because um, organizing encompasses um, much more than just being on the front lines, right? Uh, so how this kind of got started, I will go a little bit into that, um, why we're doing this now and kind of the sort of programs that we're doing and how Nyreen came to um, play a vital part uh, in the last few months. So what this project is, um, you know, as mentioned, we're looking directly at um, recording uh, oral histories and uh, collecting objects for our museum. So once things enter the Smithsonian, they are there forever. They're forever in our care. Um, so they can be alongside George Washington's pants. So that's what we do have in our political history collection. We do have his pants. So <laughs> I just think that's a really uh, fantastic thing of having um, maybe this wide spectrum of objects in there. Um, so uh, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so what our museum is doing, right, is uh, as mentioned here, I put the mission statement because uh, our museum is mostly known as a white museum. That is a nickname it has been given um, by so many people. Um, it is a nickname I have heard before when I mentioned that I work there. Uh, and what that really means is, right, it's been like a very white uh, Christian upper to middle class centric viewpoint. Um, uh, pretty much what is presented in the hallways is this kind of very narrow um, presentation of our American history. If they touch upon it, then it's not given the nuance it's really given. Um, and that is just because of how our museums have been, right? They have a history. Um, it is rooted in kind of this very colonial, very extractive practice um, and means of going in somewhere, taking and then bringing it back. So that that's that's our museum roots. That's how we got started. Um, but there's this new revitalization of looking into those practices, right? Of looking into just the museum as a whole and what what are the great things that we can do? What are the good things that we can do? And seeing our past practices and um, you know, changing them along the way, along with those we have harmed. Um, so I mentioned this because there, to be able to do this work of looking into undocumented organizers, um, we need to also be in an institutional that, uh, sorry, an institution that also validates this work, um, that also lets us do this work, that also, that sees the, the importance to kind of change um, our, our viewpoint of how we present history, and that is you know, we as a knowledge holders um, and them as a knowledge consumers. So what we're all trying to do here is also see that um, outside our museum walls are also knowledge holders. Um, they come, knowledge has come in very different ways. So it's working with community. So we're not only looking at a very vulnerable and sensitive um, subject matter, but we're also trying to work um, alongside and kind of co-create um, this, this newer history, right? Uh, this new history that has long um, has roots in, in, in violence and obscurity and, and, and pseudonyms and just overall exploitation of people. So that is our museum. We're in a cusp of great change. <laughs> Let me change the slide. Yeah, so how, uh, what exactly are we looking at? It's, um, we're looking at particularly six different sites um, across the United States and one international. Um, that being that we cannot look at this history, we cannot look at this issue without looking at also deportees and returnees. And there is a large community, as you can see in Mexico City, um, that first have modeled some of their organizing efforts in the United States, but have now kind of created their own, working with uh, local grassroots in Mexico City, as well as working with the United States. So it's a very interesting, um, aspect. Yeah, we are a national museum, but we have to look at the 
um, aftermath, especially with this issue. So the, the reason why we, we also chose six different sites, you know, it's we're a national museum, but we have to kind of ground it in uh, grassroots efforts. So we have um, both two very rural states of North Carolina and Nebraska, and who have also experienced um, recent demographic changes with um, no longer the binary of um, black and white, but also now this newer influx of different um, folks from different countries. Um, you know, DC has kind of the, the standard um, place of, of power, and there's many, uh, there's many organizers who have come here who have learned organizing strategies and have taken it back to their place of, um, to, to where they reside, or it's also just how DC is both the national and like grassroots efforts. So it's a really interesting play that we get to do with DC. Um, and with Southern California and Chicago, I mean, you have deep rooted immigrant based immigrant organizing, labor organizing. Um, so how do those histories play into this new form of immigrant rights, which is being directly led by uh, undocumented folks that, um, and I, I kind of blew past this, but I mean, this has never quite happened before in our history. Um, there's only been very few times that um, people without the right to vote or the right of citizenship are forcing the government's hand. Like, uh, I, I think we need to take a step back and like really take a look at what's happening um, before our eyes. And, and also it's, it's just like an incredible um, effort that's being organized before our eyes. They're, they're taking influences um, from past social movements. I mean, you have the gay liberation, you have um, civil rights, as mentioned, immigrant and labor rights. It's all of these past influences and current influences that are shaping how undocumented folks organize today but it's also a very 21st century social movement. You have the role of social media that allow people to come out um, or tell their stories in a very anonymous way, like early 2000s, early 2010s. Um, and now with this like cover an anonymity, um, that's a hard word, anonymity, <laughs> that's a, to, to use that, but also to kind of spread the information, right? When first, um, undocumented youth thought they were alone in their actual um, status. They, uh, social media and, and just the online forums really came to play into seeing that there is a, a community out there. So that was kind of the formation of, of, of gathering, like there's more people out there, so we need to do something about this. Um, and major legislation that came out is the DREAM Act um, in 2001. Um, most people are familiar with DACA, but that, you know, that's an executive uh, program, but that really came out of organizing. That came out of, of people, again, influencing and pushing politicians to address the issue. Um, so that's that's an overview of the sites. The objects, why I have here the butterfly wings, and I, I, I put it in there because I saw that Eddie in the, in the invitation also had it, and it briefly mentioned why butterfly wings were so important, right? The, 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 North, the North American migration, and this, the, butter, the monarch butterfly wings has really taken on a symbol of um, a campaign of migration is beautiful. And I'll go a little bit into that of like how we use this object. Um, but this object was actually collected outside a museum during a protest. And then um, from there, we actually got the idea like we're collecting these, uh, this one time thing, but we think there's, there definitely is more to this story. There is more that compelled people to A, come out of the shadows, right? To reveal their status publicly and to come to DC to organize and to, um, to make themselves known. And so, that, so this item was collected and thus was the impetus for this collecting initiative to say, um, we need to give more energy and effort into this uh, uh, initiative. And also um, we need to do it alongside with the participants um, because this history is newer history. Scholarship is barely forming, but also we know that legislation, um, the major news media or media, right, will record it in one way, but we really have a great opportunity to talk with the people making the history now. Um, and as I mentioned here, I have words from donors. So anytime an object comes into our collection, um, I make sure that the person who donated 
can write about it, their own interpretation. So that is forever in our record um, because uh, usually it's just our, our interpretation, right, about it. And there's no sense of voice. There's no sense of person behind the object. And that was one of the major, major points we wanted to get to through at this collecting initiative that yes, they are organizing. Yes, they are doing something um, pretty spectacular with strategy and, and tactics, but it's also, we need to look beyond the status. Yeah, you know, what makes the whole person. So that's kind of been our, our overall um, ethos, right, of this project, because, uh, yeah. And then I uh, mentioned that same ethos goes into oral history. So about five or six per site, it's not a lot. It's not a lot per site of really gonna get an overview of the landscape of like, how did someone organize here? What are the regional policies at hand? Was it easier? Do you have resources? Um, who, who was another organization that you were able to, you know, collaborate with? Uh, what are the difficulties? I mean, we need to get into um, most immigration circle, circles focus on just Latinx issues. When there are a large, you know, the major rising um, numbers are also Black and AAPI um, immigrants and, and, and mostly the, the rising number and undocumented, num uh, undocumented representation. So um, that's also what is included in those oral histories is like how how has this movement um, been centered in one story, right? About kind of Dreamer and DACA and this like initial and this forthright narrative of it being just um, good, good immigrants versus bad immigrants, right? Good immigrants being the the those who can speak English, those who um, are going to school, those who are young, and the, the the major term is like no fault of their own, so they made the um, the decision for them to arrive to the United States was not was not theirs to make. Um, so those are kind of the messaging points that have been um, now really hurtful to um, the larger uh, undocumented community at hand. Um, I'm kind of going all over the place in terms of <laughs> the, the the movement, but um, that oh, and as mentioned, that's that is what the the butterfly wings we can use, right? When you enter something into the museum, you don't want it to just be on one single issue. Um, so with this uh, butterfly wings, it's actually in our current exhibit. Um, the museum is closed, but once it reopens, you all should go. Um, exhibit about girlhood. So nothing to do about immigration, nothing to do about DACA, but what we were able to use these butterfly wings is that they were you, um, the person who was wearing them is from Nebraska, and she went there specifically to advocate for uh, education access, right? Higher education access. So we were able to use the story about, um, in terms of girlhood, who is able to have access to education, who is allowed to experience the girlhood, who is, uh, you know, be, uh, in terms of you being able to experience, you know, go to extracurricular activities, do all that stuff, or those who are um, need to work and take care of families and take care of their little siblings. Um, so that's what I, uh, an object needs to have multiple entry points. Um, so that's just a little museum practice right there. I, I've mentioned this a little bit about why now here in this picture we have, um, again, those, those practices of, we actually go outside the museum. Um, this was before COVID, so don't get scared of this picture. Um, uh, yeah, we would actually travel to the site and first meet with participants or potential participants. And as I say, just break bread. We would not at all request to record, tell me about, it's just like, let's just hang out. Um, so you get to know us because the Smithsonian can have a really heavy baggage, both in the good sense and in the bad sense, right? It can be like, Smithsonian is sound like, a, it, it can mean, um, a lot of different things for many different people, right? And so, especially with this community, we are a quasi-federal um, institution. We receive money, partial money from Congress. Um, we are in the National Mall. We are in DC. So again, this like place of power can have, um, it comes with a lot, especially when we wanna work with um, communities that necessarily haven't been represented in our uh, American history, that's our museum. So uh, I mentioned the question, why now? Uh, contemporary 
movement, right? It's usually a history. You look in the past, you look um, with scholarship already out there and there's many think pieces. Um, but right now we really thought that this would be a great opportunity to collect people's voices as it happens. <laughs> um, and what a wonderful uh, opportunity to have now. So we are also um, responsible for that scholarship coming out uh, because the oral histories will then come to play of people being able to do research or like look into organizing um, strategies. And may I add that this we started this in late 2018 when it was um, under a different administration. So uh, it was a very, it's a, it's still a very hostile time, but it was a very much more hostile time. So working with people was um, a little bit, um, there was a lot more hesitancy. So there was this great, op again, I mentioned great opportunity, but it really was just like a chance to record something as it's happening, as it's changing, um, because then that's reflected in oral histories and as well as it's reflected in the objects collected and how, and, um, and the, the stories that emerge. Um, and with that, right, <laughs> comes these um, wonderful, um, intricate, and very real questions about how we're doing this ethically. Um, and by ethically, I mean, how are we not perpetuating any harm, um, any sort of risk to our participants who are, you know, still undocumented? Um, and so that's why we chose organizers because they are public with their uh, status. Um, they are better acquainted with uh, either having a lawyer or understanding the risk of signing, signing uh, a document over. And we are very prepared, at least with our oral histories, to go over every single part of what does that actually mean? What does that mean when you record your history and it is now in a, again, I mentioned a quasi-federal institution. So these are the things that are always kind of guiding us. I mentioned here who has the right to tell the story. The importance of this movement is that it's being led by directly impacted people, by those who are experiencing, those who are undocumented um, currently or formally. So who are we? Um, and myself, we have an oral historian Jose Centeno Melendez and a curator, Nancy Burkhoff, and none of us are either an immigrant or are um, undocumented, right? And so again, who has the right to tell the story within a museum? Um, and those are things that were kind of guiding us along of like, uh, we have a particular interest to, to understand the social movement as it's happening, but when neither of us know this, then we needed to take extra precautions. So we formed a community advisory board um, made up all of um, undocumented organizers as well as uh, all of our participants. That, that's why it was so important for us to go um, to each site and just know and just get to know people because then they get to know us as well and uh, know that once they entrust us, we take that very seriously. Um, that we will do right by their stories and, and make sure that they're properly cared for. So, uh, and as mentioned too, are we putting participants in danger? We walk through every process. Once that is recorded, we have them transcribed um, and they transcribed and they, are, they have access uh, throughout the entire um, throughout the entire time to their audio. So the transcripts allow them to see if they mention anything that can put themselves or their families in any sort of harm or any sort of repercussions. Um, it is not until they have checked and so they have double checked that then we can deposit them in the archives um, because the, the very real existence that uh, the, the, the oral history can be heard or be put into the wrong hands. That's a very real thing, and we're very upright of like this. These are these are all the dangers that, or these are all. Um, this is what everything can happen, and before, you know, at every single chance, you have a you have an opportunity to just take it away, and that'll be fine. If you don't want to donate or or history, if you don't want to donate anything, even if we have uh, been together, even if we have worked together for 
uh, this minute years or yeah, it's about a year of this relationship building. Um, that's perfectly fine. Uh, as well as the, no, wrong one, <laughs> sorry. Um, as well as the, there's also, the, when we do an oral history, there is no template. We never ask, um, why did you come here? Where you, like all of those questions that can put them in danger is just like, tell me who you are and what you want people to know about you, how you organize, and that is it. Um, if they want to go there, perfectly fine. This is this is their chance to tell their their story however they want. But those questions, it's it's very much catered along with them. We spend months just kind of co-collaborating on what questions they want to ask, and um, they're very uh, well aware of what questions we're uh, we're going to ask because they've created those questions too. Um, so again, those those questions that can put anyone in harm are never asked. And I have here, uh, can this work be granted in restorative justice? And restorative justice to me is to address the harms, right? This is a question of redress. As a museum, as mentioned, our roots are very much grounded in um, harm, um, at least to uh, communities of color. Um, and so what we're doing, right? We are addressing the harm of like our collections. When they talked about undocumented people, it was again in a sense of obscurity and there was no agency um, from them. There was no sense of voice from this uh, from this item that talked about a person. It was just our interpretation. What are the needs um, what are the needs and obligations that we have as a museum? It's to the needs that we heard from undocumented organizers was like we want to tell our story our own way. All right. That, that was the foundation of our project, right? It was like, we're just gonna have a recorder and you just go, um, you go however you want. And the obligations is to tell the story, right? Now we have all of these um, objects in oral histories. Now, what are we gonna do with it? We, hopefully it's not just there to collect dust in our archives, in our collections. Um, and one more point is like the politics of history documenting. I think that's always just going to happen, right? Of like who gets to document this, um, who who was probably an organizer 15 years ago and is no longer, and like really left no digital record, and so I have not be able to find them, or I'm not able to contact them, or just because of miscommunication. Um, so that's always going to happen. Of like who gets to tell the story, even within the community, even within those who are organizing. It's always going to be the people who are more upfront, more public, um, you know, and, and usually the ones who are shyer but doing amazing work get to the background. So that, that also comes into play of how um, we select people um, to record. And last but not least, oh yeah, so our obligation to um, our participants is to tell the story and about a month ago, um, that's exactly what we did. We heard organizers say like, we need to share this out on your platform. They, they knew what the Smithsonian meant and the audiences they can reach were like, okay, we'll do it. And this is what um, came about. We had something called history in real time. So again, touching upon why we're recording and, and unfolding social movements um, with undocumented organizers to just talk However, th th there was only two questions and they just went went for it for an hour. Um, and I mentioned this because um, what's so critical and important is about storytelling, right? We have these amazing uh, objects in, in uh, oral histories, but we don't want them just to collect us or just be behind glass. Um, as a collecting initiative, there is no there is no chance, at least in the foreseeable future, for the, it to be an exhibit. So as, as much as we don't like that news, we um, are going away of like, okay, well, if we can't be contained within the museum, then let's go out. Um, so this was our first phase of going about that. And we really, to, I mean, this was since last summer, this kind of uh, <laughs> this effort to get this out. And you know, when I received an application from uh, someone who had the audio and storytelling skills, especially with video, I that that just like ringed my bell. Um, 
to bring someone in, especially to tell stories, right? Um, and that's actually a very hard form to kind of keep it contained, keep it, keep it interested and to understand that the first five seconds of audio or video are essential to capture an audience, especially when our audience is um, not very familiar with these histories. It's uh, more of the, the mainstream um, histories that we get in our high school. So it's not really allowing for that nuance of, you know, of API history or Latinx history or Black history to kind of also put that on the table that this is all American history. It's not just one viewpoint, right? All of those intricacies, all of those complications um, are all part of our shared history. And so, uh, yeah, uh, this program was really um, incredibly successful because we had Nyreen join us in, I believe, September and really kind of think through, um, think through these bigger ideas of like, the questions that I mentioned about who has the right to tell the story and how do we tell the story justly and ethically and with such respect to the people we're working with and understanding that they, their history um, their history and that the, the histories that they're creating um, should be in our museum and, uh, and shared with others because again this is our shared history um, and I'm going to take it now to Nyreen and, and thank you so much for listening. Um, I will share my email if anyone is interested in contacting me, but um, yeah, we are, we're always looking for interns, um, but th they have been so instrumental in, in the work that I've, um, that we've been able to build together because um, we're only a three person team. We're very small. I'm the only full-time person dedicated to this project. Um, and there is a lot, as you saw, six sites, uh, there's multiple moving parts as well as keeping up with relationships with people because um, that is my favorite part, but it's also the most difficult part. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, Patty, thank you very much for your insight today and for all the details that you furnished about this initiative and the program. Mm -hmm. And certainly I just wanted to play back some of the words that have been expressed here in the chat. I hear from uh, Professor Ducey that certainly uh, it, the message has landed and she can certainly um, uh, understand and see the great danger that revealing this research can pose for those involved. Uh, we're hearing from Dr. Malvo that he's expressing um, that it's wonderful that undocumented people are getting a platform to express themselves. Uh, certainly some people here agree. Uh, from Jennifer Baugh, our, our, one of our partners here at the PPHI, says that uh, she's thanking you and thanking everybody here for recording the history, the stories and voices of, of, of the society and that she judges that it's very important in bringing about change. And then we, so we have a couple of questions here. And uh, since we have a little bit of time, we're really good on time. Um, uh, we will um, move on to the, the question and answer session at the end, right? Um, uh, we will reserve those towards the end. Um, and um, we certainly do hear uh, lots of wonderful news here and everybody's very happy to hear about all this news and all the success that you've been having with Nyreen's skill set. And I just wanted to underscore what I was hearing from you today, Patty. I was hearing today that, that Nyreen's success really hinged upon her ability to uh, work with audio technologies, her, her talents in storytelling and video editing, uh, and certainly keeping the interest of, of those in engaged alive. And in addition to her research that she conducted for the program, I just wanted to underscore what you were saying, you were saying here. And so, so Professor Ducey, I wanted to call upon her to introduce herself briefly, since at the beginning, we were not able to do so. Um, so she was saying, thank you very much, um, uh, Patty, for your time today. And she's uh, so intrigued by your comments and your work is inspiring, she's explaining to us. And so she very much appreciates uh, you taking the time to share all this content with us. Uh, and so with that, I just wanted to introduce our, our director here so that she she can say a few words of welcome before we move on to Nyreen's piece where Nyreen will effectively talk about her internship research uh, with you, uh, working with you, Patty, and then with her, her mentor, Dr. Moran, who I believe is also on the call today, uh, who worked with her and supported her through this program. Um, uh, Professor Ducey, please. So hello, thank you so much, Eddie. Um, I just wanted to say welcome to all of you, but I have a very special thank you to Patty for um, for offering our student, Irene, this amazing experience and for the work that she does for the Smithsonian. And what an amazing, um, that was a very short presentation that was just packed, right? 
you, we, we could have spent all day listening to her. I, I just have to say it was remarkable. I feel like I really have a sense for it. I also did not know about the monarch butterflies, the symbolism involved there, and, and has really sparked some thoughts in my mind, um, actually, uh, about future work. The, um, the Smithsonian has partnered with the Paul Peck Humanities Institute for years in many different ways. And in fact, I, I tease that we really probably ought to do one of those social mapping tools to figure out all the different places that we sort of touch each other and support one another. But to have someone like Patty at the museum doing the work that she's doing is such an amazing move forward for our nation for, for the research work that must be done. And I love the fact that the Smithsonian is, you know, like it's a history museum and they're, in, they're living, as the work is happening, they're capturing this living history. Um, I know that some of you don't really think that way, though we have historians on the call, but um, I think the pandemic has made many of my students to be much more keen about understanding that each moment is a part of contributing to history. And, um, and this special work that you're doing, Patty, we're just really proud of the work you're doing, really pleased and, and look forward to learning more as the, as the project on schools. Um, I just wanna do a quick compliment to Eddie, who has been coordinating this uh, program now um, in the most capable way and the most intentional and beautiful structure. So we all are benefiting from that. And, um, and then I wanna just honor Nyreen, who is going to speak to you shortly, who is a really special student, a very special person, um, and who has been described by Patty herself as a superstar. So um, I will back out of the picture, but just say thank you, thank you. Uh, and thank you to all of our um, attendees for learning more about this program and about all the work that the Smithsonian is doing specifically with this project, and then to learn more about our internship and help us recruit these very special students. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. And I just wanted to underscore uh, Dr. Moran, who, uh, uh, who mentored um, uh, Nyreen, uh, expresses her thanks uh, for sharing this work with us today, Patty, again, and for all the work that you're doing at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History to make it more inclusive. And so we uh, we know we have lots of questions, perhaps lots of really interesting, um, stimulating content we want to uh, include at the end once we start re stop recording. But today I wanted to introduce to you again, Nairi Monforte was our uh, outgoing intern from fall 2020. Uh, she did a, a, fab a fabulous, uh, phenomenal job in uh, really up, up, up upholding the values and tenets of this internship program, which really is excellence and, and commitment and, and grit and, and curiosity and all of those uh, wonderful qualities that uh, we always appreciate and try to support and, and cultivate and inculcate in all of our students. So Nairi, without further ado, um, you have a full attention please feel free uh, to uh, share your screen and we look forward to having about 30 minutes with you. After those 30 minutes, we'll have about 20 minutes of Q&A time uh, and feel free to type your questions into the chat now or as they come up and I will do my best to honor them and to weave them into our conversation this afternoon. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Professor Rana. Yeah, so again, um, hi everyone, my name is Nyreen um, and I'll be sharing with you all my internship experience. So from last fall to this past January, I interned at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, specifically working with the Undocumented Political Organizing Collecting Initiative. Um, and I was mentored by Patty, um, obviously. <laughs> and this initiative seeks to document the history of undocumented organizing over the past 20 years and how young people without citizenship have shaped American democracy. Um, and as Patty explained earlier, this is being done through the collection of oral histories and objects. So last month in late February, the team released a website titled Tell Me What Democracy Looks Like. Um, and at the center of this website are these stories from undocumented organizers. And it's meant to be a space for undocumented people to talk back to the museum and to share their own ideas on um, creating history. Uh, so it features um, testimonial videos from five organizers discussing specific points in the history of undocumented organizing. Um, and along with these videos are learning labs, which are curated resources for educators to use that explore the same five themes in these videos. And in addition, this website launched with a live program um, 
that Patty talked about, referenced earlier, um, that reflects on all of these ideas and these narratives. Um, and these images on the screen, they're a couple protest posters um, the museum has in its collection. So I performed a variety of tasks over the course of my internship, but most of my work centered on helping with the development of this website. So I researched materials and brainstormed um, preliminary discussion questions for the learning labs. I also helped in the production process of the testimonial videos, um, which was directed by Maria Sanchez, a media producer at the museum and another amazing mentor. Um, and lastly, I was given the opportunity to produce a short trailer that was played at the beginning of the live program and was used for social media promotion. So I'm now <laughs> going to share what the website looks like. Um, so this is on the museum's website. I can share a link later. Um, and if you uh, navigate the sidebar or scroll down, you can see um, the five organizers we feature and the themes they talk about, which includes mutual aid during uh, the COVID pandemic, the political and emotional aftermath of 9-11 on the immigrant and undocumented community, the impact of the DREAM Act, uh, intersectionality, and lastly, the criminalization of immigration. So the intersection between the criminal justice system and immigration policy. Um, so if you check one of these pages, uh, you can see the testimonial video that features the organizer. It's about five minutes long. There's a brief um, biography about the organizer and also a learning lab. So this is what one of the learning labs looks like. So these learning labs help students and educators see how the current undocumented movement, which is still evolving, still becoming um, a historical moment in real time, how all of this is connected to our past and to American history. Um, so it has the video, it has um, guiding questions, it has, ooh, did not mean to click that. Sorry about that. Um, it has objects from the museum and also other resources to help um, people uh, facilitate discussions on these five themes. Um, and now I'm going to share um, the trailer I made for the live program. <laughs> and this live program was hosted on February 26, I believe. Um, and the recording of it uh, is here on the website. Um, and it's a culminating reflection of all the work that's featured on this site as it combines museum professionals with organizers and academics to discuss what a history of the undocumented movement might look like. If I didn't say anything, it really couldn't be left to anyone else to talk about these experiences the framing of these narratives and who we look at as being immigrants needs to be interrogated. There's been a narrative of what goodness is because sometimes being twice as good doesn't change anything if the system's corrupt. This isn't just a policy issue. These issues have faces. These, these issues have stories. They have lives. But what hurts is that people consume my story and then are not driven to action. Organizing is not for me, for me, it's not a choice. It's not my career. Organizing is not my job. Organizing is not my passion, not like that. I'm not well physically, mentally, spiritually, maybe politically as well. It's not going to be sustainable. I wish if we could have done this all over, like if I wasn't five years old um, back in 2000, or if I, I had some kind of power then, if we could have all come together and been like, what are we doing? Is this right? I'm like, what does this mean for our future? So yeah, that's the trailer um, I was able to produce. Um, and I'll try to go over like 
my creative process and trying to produce this trailer. So um, at the center of this whole project, this whole website, this whole initiative is again, this question of who has the right to tell this history. And I wanted that to be really clear in the trailer. Um, so I did that by taking clips from the conversations we had with these five organizers um, that I thought embodied these um, ideas and these questions on um, narratives and memory and agency. Um, and I tried to stitch another story out of that. Um, and also in the beginning of the trailer, uh, there's a couple protest posters that are featured. Um, and I feel like those different demands are also stories in of themselves. Um, and showing the nuance of um, uh, the undocumented movement and um, the politics they're bringing to the table. Um, so yeah, I, I wanted the trailer to serve um, as a cohesive introduction to the ethos of not just the live program, but the website overall. Um, and with the guidance of my mentors, um, I think I executed that and I'm really proud of what I was able to contribute. Um, so yeah, that's the website. Uh, Tell me what democracy looks like. I definitely recommend to check it out on your own time after this program. And I can share a link later. Um, but yeah, on to the rest of my presentation. Um, so now I'll share the successes and growth I experienced during this internship. So I learned a lot in terms of career development, professional skills, and personal growth. Um, I came into this internship wanting to investigate how um, museum curation and museum work acts as a storytelling medium. And as it's made from, as it's made clear from <laughs> what everyone has talked about and the internship product that I made, um, I have a skill set in video production. I was a digital storytelling intern at the college last spring, um, and I have intentions to become a documentary filmmaker, which, you know, on first glance seems entirely different from <laughs> museum education, but I wanted to see if that same skill set has any place or purpose in a museum, um, because I learned at the core of both practices, like video production or documentary making specifically and with museum work is one storytelling and two community building. It was really enlightening to see how the museum continues to share knowledge and be accessible during the pandemic by using the internet and creating live stream programs and these videos and these new websites. Um, when I was working with Maria, she told me that the digital team before the pandemic um, was more so creating content to promote a lot of the in-person events the Smithsonian was hosting. But now that everything has transitioned online, they have um, a lot more say in the content they can produce, um, which is really interesting. I also found that this project greatly aligned with the ethics and principles I want to follow in my own work. It's a lot of listening, a lot of decentering your own space and platforming others, and a lot of relationship building. I found that engaging with history, stories, and people um, is something really fulfilling to me so much that I'm now considering pursuing a minor in Asian American studies when I transfer to the University of Maryland in the fall. So this internship was also my introduction to teleworking. It's a totally different environment to work in that I'm used to since there's no in-person contact and I finished all of my deliverables over Microsoft Teams. Um, but having familiarity with all of it now um, is definitely going to be useful since teleworking might become the new normal after um, what's happened <laughs> this past year. I'm so sorry if you hear my dog barking. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, uh, because work and collaboration are pretty separated now, I also practiced a lot of self-advocacy and definitely improved my verbal and written communication. Um, having those transferable skills is really important, no matter what professional setting you're in. Um, I'm also really grateful that Patty introduced me to some amazing staff members at the Smithsonian. 
um, and I was able to engage in some networking. Uh, now that my internship is over, I'm now practicing sustaining all of these fantastic connections that I've made. So in terms of personal growth, this initiative allowed me to deeply engage with a part of contemporary history I never looked into, and I'm immensely grateful for that. It was really humbling to listen to these oral histories and to learn from these organizers and to learn more about immigrant justice. Um, and I really empathize with their struggle, but also their joy and perseverance as well. I found it particularly interesting to see how the organizers we've talked to analyze citizenship. I think a lot of people, including myself before this internship, treat citizenship in very concrete legal terms. Like you have this passport or this green card or this ID or you don't, it's an either or situation. Um, but for those that have liminal status, the goal isn't necessarily to achieve that sense of citizenship, but rather to find a sense of belonging or to feel safe or to just have the ability to stay with their people. It's more complicated than ink on a piece of paper, which I found eye-opening. It really challenged me to think bigger than the systems that are already in place and to reflect on who I consider to be my community. So I wanted to further investigate these questions on citizenship in my independent research and apply it to the Filipino American community since my parents are Filipino immigrants. Um, and in this part of the internship, I was mentored by Dr. Moran and she has been a great help in um, fine tuning my arguments and my writing. Um, so for the research I had to conduct for this internship, I decided to read America is in the Heart by Carlos Bulosan and see how his literature reflected Filipino American understandings of citizenship in the early 20th century. Bulosan was part of the Manong generation, which was the first generation of Filipino immigrants to come to the United States in the early 1900s. And I guided my research with this question. Through Carlos Bulosan's writing, how did the Manong generation cultivate their own ideas of citizenship and belonging? So for some brief background, Carlos Bulosan was a farm worker, union, union organizer, and writer. He was born in the Philippine province of Pangasinan to a family of peasant farmers. And Pangasinan is highlighted in red on this map. Bulosan immigrated to the United States in 1930 in his late teenage years and spent the rest of his life in the US as a migrant laborer and a political activist. His novel, America is in the Heart, is a semi-fictionalized account of his immigration journey and his life in the United States during the Great Depression. Since the novel is grounded in reality and personal experience, I used it as a stepping stone to interrogate what Filipino American identity was during this time period. So as I mentioned earlier, Carlos Bulosan was part of the Manong generation. Manong is an affectionate term for an older brother in Ilocano, which is a language spoken in the northern part of the Philippines and where a lot of these men came from. The Manong generation was comprised of entirely bachelor working class men. They were migrant laborers traveling along the west coast of the United States as field hands cannery workers or other menial jobs. Um, this picture is a group of them who worked in a fish cannery in Alaska in 1926. Um, so they were like on the assembly line, literally like stuffing salmon into cans. That, that's what a cannery worker is. Um, so yeah, the Manung's relationship and identification with America was very complex. Um, and that's because they were marginalized in multiple ways through citizenship, class, and race. After the Spanish-American War in 1898, 
the Philippines became a colony of the United States. Um, and this was also the same era where the US had a very isolationist immigration policy. Um, so they needed labor, but they just didn't know where to turn to. Um, and since the Philippines was not a foreign country, but rather a territory of the United States, um, the US turned it into an export economy for tropical goods and more importantly, uh, labor. Colonialism ultimately motivated this migration pattern um, from the Philippines to the United States to begin. And that migration pattern continues to this day as my family immigrated here in the early 90s. Um, in the book, uh, Carlos immigrates to America because um, his family is in immense debt. And um, he decided to try to help pay back that debt by following his brothers to the US and trying to find um, good paying jobs there. Because many Manongs came from peasantry and they um, weren't highly educated, they were only able to find manual labor jobs in the United States. And because of that, they were subjected to brutal working conditions and were not fairly compensated for their work. In the United States, although they were um, subjects of the US, they weren't citizens um, and they weren't seen as people but rather hands to pick fruit and vegetables or bodies to extract profit from. They weren't seen as fully American in this way. Um, and this poor treatment caused the Manongs to be alienated from any understanding of themselves as human beings outside of their labor. To add to this multi-layered paradox, Filipino men were also racialized between black and East Asian men. Um, they were seen as promiscuous, um, which is a stereotype of black men, but also docile and servile at the same time, which is a stereotype of East Asian men. And because the Manongs were objectified in numerous layers as colonial subjects, as working class folk, and as um, the non-white brown other, they were never allowed to assimilate into the capitalist white American order. They were always seen as less than or something exotic, something entirely different than what it meant to be American. And this marginalization was enforced violent, violently through legal and social means, um, through miscegenation laws, which forbade Filipino men from marrying white American women, um, through labor exploitation, as I mentioned earlier, um, and through vigilante violence. So these are newspaper clippings of just a few documented incidents of anti-Filipino violence that happened in the early 1900s. In the book, America's in the Heart, Carlos extensively talks about the times he was driven out of town or how he witnessed other Filipino men um, being beat up and killed by law enforcement. Um, in the book, there's this continuous theme of displacement and anxiety and fear. Using Edward Said's words, this generation of immigrants were exiles. Because they were poor, they were never able to return to the Philippines. And where they settled here in the US, people wouldn't accept them either. But despite this sense of exile, many Manungs were able to find their own sense of belonging through labor organizing by advocating for rights such as land ownership, safe housing, and fair wages. The Manungs were able to take back the agency that had been stripped by them, by the state. In the process, they built a community, a new interpretation of what it meant to be American um, that was based in democratic practice, equity, and inclusion. So this image is a, from a Filipino-American newspaper, and it's urging Filipino workers to demand higher wages after the Watsonville riots, um, which happened in California in 1930, um, another incident of anti-Filipino violence um, in which one Filipino man, Fermin Tobera, was killed. Um, so in the book, tying it back to the book, the turning point for Carlos's life, um, which mirrors the actual writer's life, um, is when he realizes um, 
he could use his words, his writing skills to speak truth to power. Um, and writing for Filipino newspapers like these allowed him to get involved in labor organizing. And that's where he found hope in the American dream. So through their activism, the Manong generation's legacy will forever be a part of America's history of civil rights. Um, so I wanted to tie this sort of niche history to a more well-known, more relatively recent um, contemporary moment. So this picture is from the 1960s um, Delano grape strike, um, which created what we now know as the United Farm Workers. Um, and this grape strike was actually started by Manongs, who um, by this time were elderly men in their 60s and 70s. Um, men like Larry Itliong, which is, he's the man on um, the left. And other men like Philip Veracruz, they worked alongside Cesar Chavez and other Mex Mexican organizers to build community power that eventually secured these farm workers with a collective bargaining agreement. So yeah, I just wanted to end that moment and end on that moment in history. So yeah, finally some reflections and words of advice that I took from this internship and can be applied to any professional or academic work in my opinion. Um, so first and foremost, look for opportunities to learn. Always approach things with an open mind and be curious. You don't know what skills you could learn or what ideas could interest you. Um, I feel like it was uh, a plan of fate maybe for me to um, be mentored by Patty and to be a part of this internship experience because it, it really wasn't something I, I knew a lot about. Um, and going through this work and doing this research really opened up my mind and um, allowed me to learn more about um, uh, ethnic history in the United States and labor organizing um, and immigrant justice. Second, don't be afraid to reach out to others, especially when everything is virtual. Um, I think building community is very important in internship experiences like these um, because it's always it's always beneficial to find people that you can fall back on um, when you need um, support or advice or leadership. Third, stay organized, which is self-explanatory. Um, and finally, take care of yourself. I really enjoyed this internship because it turned into a very formative part um, of what was a tumultuous year. Um, and I want to share that joy and that energy with you all, uh, wherever you decide to carry it. So yeah, that's my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, thank you very much, um, Nirene, for your informative and very insightful and inspiring presentation. And I'm going to send you a clap emoji. I know I see lots of them. Um, I'm going to attempt to, uh, to uh, summarize some of the feedback that I've been hearing, and I'll do that purposefully and intentionally so that you hear this positive feedback of your amazing work. After I do that, um, I will summarize some of the questions that are come up and then I will end uh, the, the recording part and then we'll get to the Q&A, which will not be recorded, right? And so I'm hearing from um, lots, lots of people here um, regarding your presentation uh, that surf, surf, certainly they're very interested in your topic and they have lots of questions regarding uh, the content, uh, but I'm hearing fantastic presentation. This was amazing, great job. Thank you for sharing your energy, very inspiring, brilliant job. Thank you for sharing your joy and your energy. And uh, so uh, we give you again that, that clap emoji. Thank you very much for, uh, for that inspiring talk. <laughs>